to be the first of two remaining presenters for our session today. And we're going to transition to talking about ideal uses of uncoated weathering steel. Jeff mentioned we have several options. So we're specifically going to focus on when uncoated weathering steel would be the best choice and what the best uh, detailing, fabrication, construction, et cetera, guidelines are in those situations. So I'm going to start things off uh, and then I'll transition this to Tom Murphy about halfway through. So we're basically going to be talking about this uncoated weathering steel manual that was recently developed and is forthcoming in the near future. So I'll start with some brief background on how this manual was developed. What we'll call the uncoated weathering steel manual for short or UWS manual is an even shorter acronym. This was sponsored by the American Institute of Steel Construction and the National Steel Bridge Alliance with the content being developed by myself and Travis Hopper, Ed Wasserman, and Tom Murphy from Majeski and Masters. As you can see from the high-level outline of the manual that's shown here, the scope of the manual covers the full life cycle of an uncoated weathering steel bridge from initial design through repair and rehabilitation, the details of which we will be discussing today. To provide some context for why this level of effort was put into a guidance document on this specific material, the answer to that question, like many questions, is really about cost. What we're seeing here is some data that Jeff compiled in 2020 from AISC fabricator members, and this shows the relative cost of different corrosion protection systems. And so what we see here on the far left is the minimal first cost of uncoated weathering steel. There are also life cycle costs, as well as environmental and traffic and worker safety benefits due to avoiding the need for repainting throughout the life cycle. So for these reasons, the recommendation is that uncoated weathering steel should be the default corrosion protection system for steel bridges in environments where its use is appropriate and when it is properly detailed, which will be some of our main discussion points for today. Some final introductory comments before we get into the specific guidance is to talk about some of the objectives of the manual that we had in mind as we were developing this document which are that first, this document serves as a collection and synthesis of various best practices using the latest available data. This builds off of a Federal Highway Administration technical advisory on the use of uncoated weathering steel that is now about three decades old. And the National Steel Bridge Alliance saw a need to provide owners and designers with more information on determining where the use of uncoated weathering steel is appropriate and other best practices. And lastly, the FHWA guidance is in the process of being updated. So the vision for this document is that it will serve as a companion to the FHWA document, which is more narrowly focused on design issues only and does not speak to construction, inspection, maintenance, et cetera, at the present. So moving into the more technical content by talking about whether or not uncoated weathering steel is appropriate for a particular site. The overview for this section of the manual is shown here, which is that the main idea of this section of the manual and our corresponding discussion of it today is when to use uncoated weathering steel and when to proceed cautiously with it or not use uncoated weathering steel. The concepts for how to determine this are based on two main categories of environments termed the macro environment and the micro environment, which some of the main environments of caution that we'll, we will be discussing today are listed here. So to set the background for these recommendations that we're going to get into, Many of you may be familiar with the current FHWA guidance on site selection for uncoated weathering steel. Those are listed here, where we can see there are three general environments and two specific site locations where in the FHWA terminology, UWS should be used with caution. 
So these are a starting point for whether or not to use uncoated weathering steel. However, what you will notice as you read through this list is that these recommendations are mostly qualitative and questions like how far from the coast defines a marine environment or how much rainfall is considered high rainfall are ones that are routinely asked. So one of our specific objectives was to compile, review, and synthesize the available information that has been developed over the past 30 years to provide some industry standard guidance on when on answering these questions where possible. So our guidance on where to use uncoated weathering steel can be summarized by this graphic, which I'll show again in a few minutes, but I'm showing here as a preview for where our discussion is leading. And for now, just emphasize a couple main ideas. Uh, first is that we have a somewhat engineered decision tree type process that ultimately results in one of three decisions. Either do not use uncoated weathering steel or at the other extreme, uncoated weathering steel is ideal or an intermediate situation that we've termed use uncoated weathering steel thoughtfully. And these intermediate situations are ones where uncoated weathering steel may be the ideal choice um, it may perform better or as well as any other structural material or coating system, but also decreased performance of uncoated weathering steel may occur. So in these situations, we recommend adding a sacrificial thickness to the uncoated weathering steel as a corrosion allowance or developing a proactive maintenance plan and the financial resources to implement it. Or third option would be choosing an alternative corrosion protection system. So we'll walk through the specifics of which environments get sorted into which of these categories. The other main idea I want to emphasize here is that we have two main concepts of uh, macro environment and micro environment, and that a key consideration that's relatively novel in the updated guidance is how these two labels interact to affect the performance of uncoated weathering steel. So to talk more about the concept of macro and micro environment and their interaction, just to make sure everyone is on the same footing with these terms, macro environment is the general environment of a relatively large geographic region. What we're looking at here on the left is a land use map. Uh, this one is specific to Texas, but most states have some version of this and the specifics are not particularly important. What I'd like to highlight instead is that we have urban areas in red, waterways in blue, and various forms of what we would generally lump together as rural in shades of green and orange. The micro environment then refers to zooming in on the specifics of any site within these large geographic areas to consider site features that may lead to a more or less corrosive environment relative to the general surroundings. This typically involves considering what the bridge is crossing and site features like vegetation, which we will get deeper into momentarily. So we'll start with the macro environment considerations where our main concepts in evaluating the corrosivity of any environment are the presence of chlorides and the humidity, because both of those accelerate corrosion rates. So in short, too much humidity or too much chlorides result in poor performance of uncoated weathering steel and other structural materials. Chlorides can either be naturally occurring chlorides due to the atmospheric chloride concentrations along coastlines or chlorides from de-icing agents. If we think about the situation shown on the left where um, certainly de-icing agents would have been applied by any state transportation agency or any transportation agency, um, de-icing agents can affect that bridge from two sources, either from leaking joints on the roadway above uh, which Tom will talk about mitigating in a few minutes, or from being dissolved into the snow melt on the roadway beneath the structure, and then that liquid being dispersed and sprayed onto the bridge from the traffic traveling underneath it. So both of those are, are considerations we need to keep in mind as we move forward. <clears throat> 
Historically, macro environments have been divided into four main categories, which are largely qualitative. So if we start to think through these four environments, rural, urban, industrial, and coastal, and think about them in terms of chlorides and humidity, the first conclusion we can make is that the rural environment is relatively benign and there's no special considerations needed here. The concern for an urban environment could be a level of de-icing agent use that is extreme enough to cause accelerated corrosion of uncoated weathering steel. There are no general concerns for an urban environment as a whole, so we will discuss this topic as a microenvironment issue. Industrial environments were a historical concern, but the enactment of clean air standards has mitigated pollution levels to the point where this is no longer a concern. So our discussion of macro environments will focus on defining a coastal environment. As we start to think about defining a coastal environment, we can think about two possible extremes to start to bound our thinking. Perhaps at one end, of the extreme, we have the entire state of Florida, which we could argue is surrounded by saltwater. Or at the other end of the spectrum, we have a bridge crossing a body of saltwater. But to think about which of those situations best describes a coastal environment or what the threshold is for the intermediate status, we need to think about the humidity levels and the chlorides. To get more specific, we have two possible definitions of humidity. The first is based on time of wetness, where time of wetness is the number of hours per year that the relative humidity exceeds 80% and the temperature is above freezing. With 60% time of wetness equaling 5,500 hours per year being generally accepted as a threshold for concern. And this is labeled as category five by the International Standards Organization or ISO. Steve Chase compiled the data shown here on the right, which shows that category five levels of time of wetness are relatively rare, being limited to areas along the Pacific Northwest coastline. Those are the only places we're seeing the, the red dots representing time of wetness five. So our recommendations for this level of time of wetness were based on reviewing the performance of uncoated weathering steel bridges that existed in that time of wetness five environment. And this was where we started to uh, become, the connection between the mi macro environment and micro environment started to become more apparent. So our recommendations are in summary, if the microenvironment does not have any features that would further elevate the humidity, and I'll describe what those are momentarily, then uncoated weathering steel is recommended. Conversely, for microenvironments that do cause elevated humidity, uncoated weathering steel is not recommended. So using time of wetness is one metric that correlates with field performance quantitatively, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So a second humidity metric that has been used is simply relative humidity, which is also likely to be more familiar. What we are looking at here is average monthly humidity contour maps that have been compiled by NOAA. And what I wanna draw your attention to here are the light and dark shades of red on these maps, which correspond to average relative humidities exceeding 76%. So again, based on looking at field performance data, we see a correlation between when that level of humidity occurs for at least eight months of the year, or if you wanna think about this, um, in other words, if eight or more months of the year are in the red, meaning an average relative humidity exceeding 75% for most of the year, um, we possibly have an excessive level of humidity. Uh, from a rough skim of these figures, you can see this generally occurs along a relatively small but important portion along the Gulf coastline. And at these lower humidity levels compared to the time of wetness threshold, significant chlorides are also necessary to be simultaneously present 
in order to cause accelerated corrosion at levels that may be of concern. What that level of chloride is, is difficult to precisely determine, but what is easier to analyze is the performance as a function of distance to the coast, which can be indirectly related to chloride concentrations. This is the approach being implemented in the ongoing FHWA study on this topic, but the best available data on this metric at the present time comes from a study by Rich Granada focused on performance in Florida where two miles from the coast was viewed as a reasonable threshold for where uncoated weathering steel could be used with confidence. So this information combined with the relative humidity data and considering microenvironments leads to alternative recommendations depending upon whether just one of these parameters, so just uh, distance to the coast is low, but if there's not high humidity, uh, the use of uncoated weathering steel is recommended, or conversely, if we have high humidity, but we're more than two miles from the coast, that also indicates acceptable performance of uncoated weathering steel. But as two or three of those parameters of coast, high humidity, and the microenvironment start to interact, we become uh, more restrictive on the recommendations on the use of weathering steel. So if only two of those parameters are maximized, we recommend that thoughtful use of uncoated weathering steel category. And if all three of those parameters are severe, the recommendation is to not use uncoated weathering steel. So now defining what those microenvironments are that are of concern. This is based on the same concept of screening for features that might increase the humidity or increase the chloride exposure. To do this, the considerations are crossing type, vegetation, and shelter from sunlight. Starting with crossing types, we can consider our three main crossing types as grade separations or highway crossings, rail crossings, and water crossings. Then starting with grade separations, we can further divide this category into whether the bridge is crossing a heavily salted roadway or not. Note the all caps on the word heavily, which I'll elaborate on later, but represents extreme combinations of de-icing agent use and high traffic to cause significant enough levels of chlorides to accumulate on the superstructures of a highway overpass. In the absence of these conditions, and assuming the lack of a coastal environment, we expect to see ideal performance of uncoated weathering steel in highway overpasses. Similarly, because railways are not salted and the only possible concern here is sulfur oxide emissions, which are at benign levels, we also see good performance of bridges in the microclimate of a railway crossing. For waterway crossings, we have three subcategories that we considered. First, most waterway crossings are a benign microenvironment. A more severe microenvironment is when the bridge provides a low clearance over water, which has generally been defined as eight to 10 feet. The concern here is increased humidity, partially due to the closer proximity of water. And then lastly, the most severe case is a structure over salt water, particularly in a location where there are breaking waves, which in that such situation, the use of weathering steel is not recommended. In addition to what the bridge is crossing, two other microclimates to consider are those with dense vegetation and excessive shelter. Dense vegetation can be roughly defined as the vegetation being in contact or nearly in contact with the structure as this increases the humidity or traps moisture. As shown in the photo on the left where the skirter is experiencing some through thickness section loss in that location. Dense vegetation like shown on the right can also cause excessive shelter which has been roughly defined in some international guidelines as the bridge being in shadow between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., which we loosely translated to be in shadow for six hours per day. In either of these situations, 
options are to modify the site if possible or to modify the structure. Getting into some quantification of these microenvironments, whether or not a bridge is heavily salted is largely a function of the snowfall and the average daily traffic or ADT. Because the largest concern, assuming the joints are properly detailed as Tom will discuss, is road spray from the traffic below. The vertical in underclearance, which is the distance between the superstructure and the roadway is also important. So we have recommendations for how to define some of these variables, specifically 20 inches of snowfall and 20 feet for vertical clearance when both of those situations are also combined with a high ADT. This situation has previously been termed a tunnel-like environment, but I'd like to emphasize that the tunnel situation geometry alone is irrelevant if there are not excessive de-icing agents used. So a, a tunnel situation in Florida is not a, a micro environment of concern, for example. Low clearance over waterways is one aspect where FHWA currently provides quantitative guidance of eight to 10 feet, as previously mentioned, and reviewing literature on this topic leads to the conclusion that that distance is at least accept acceptable and possibly conservative. So tying all those details together, we return to the flow chart that I showed at the beginning where the micro environment and macro environments are, are quantitatively considered to result in a recommendation on the use of uncoated weathering steel. We can also illustrate that same concept in table form where the combinations of environments where uncoated weathering steel is not recommended or where the thoughtful use of uncoated weathering steel is recommended are clearly identified. And here I'll note that while those categories occupy most of the space on this table, the vast majority of cases will fall into the all other category for micro environment and the all other category for micro environment. So we'll end up in the green square here, resulting in the recommendation to use uncoated weathering steel in most cases. And now I'd like to turn things over to Tom to review the rest of the uncoated weathering steel recommendations. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, so assuming you've, you've been through the process that Jennifer has just uh, laid out and decided that uncoated weathering steel is the appropriate um, material for use on your structure, what uh, can you do as a designer or an owner uh, to ensure that you get uh, the best possible uh, lifespan and performance out of that material? Um, so if there's nothing else you remember from this portion of the, of the presentation, uh, it should be this, and that's eliminate joints wherever possible. Um, it's, the experience is quite clear. Anytime you have water uh, directly discharging onto steel, you have poor performance, whether that steel is, is painted or, or uncoated weathering steel. Um, so the use of integral abutment bridges, uh, other types of, of jointless bridges, semi-integral abutments, uh, moving the joints behind the back walls, uh, using link slabs, uh, anything you can do there to, to eliminate joints uh, is really the best thing that you can do in terms of extending the lifespan, really, of any kind of bridge, uh, but in particular for uncoated weathering steel. Um, as designers, we tend to focus on the structural aspects of a bridge, um, but really you need to pay attention to the drainage as well. Um, the drainage systems, where the water goes, um, really does control, uh, in many ways, the lifespan of a bridge. Um, you know, in, in the olden days, uh, they might use open joints with, without any protection to the steel underneath. Uh, we've learned that that's a terrible way of doing things. Um, so uh, if you still have open joints on your bridge, you can do things like install drainage troughs and other things to keep water from getting to your structure. Uh, next slide then. So once you've done that and, and eliminated as joints as much as possible and the joints that you do have, you've um, tried to control the drainage coming off of them, um, what else do you need to consider? Um, uncoated weathering steel needs drying cycles to function properly and to form that patina. Um, it's okay if it gets wet as long as it then dries out completely. Um, so if you have trap debris or moist, trap debris, uh, dirt, uh, pigeon droppings, anything like that that can trap moisture against the surface of your uncoated weathering steel, uh, that will promote continued corrosion and prevent the patina from forming. Um, so here we have a couple of pictures that show examples of this on the left um, is a bearing assembly uh, of, I believe, a truss bridge uh, where you can see that dirt and even mud has gotten in there. Uh, 
um, and that's going to prevent uh, the water that collects there from ever drying out. You can you can kind of see in that image that you've already got layers of steel that have that have begun to peel off there in, in corrosion. And on the right is a, is an angle uh, formed that has collected debris, and you can see that the dark color of the debris kind of shows that it's it's collected moisture there, and it's not allowing that moisture to evaporate. And so the steel underneath that debris is, is continuing to corrode. Uh, areas where this uh, often happens uh, uh, are on haunched girders. Uh, if you don't, if you're not careful with the detailing, um, these these areas will tend to collect debris. So on the left is a uh, uncoated weathering steel bridge that has uh, had a lot of debris collect over the years. I think it's been cleaned off for the inspection in this case. Uh, but you can see where it was and the um, sort of a continuous corrosion that's occurred there. Um, so you need, as a designer, to, to always think about um, when you're adding stiffeners and when you're detailing your girders, uh, where debris uh, can collect, where corrosion can be trapped, or where moisture can be trapped and cause corrosion. Um, the image on the right, although it's of a painted bridge, uh, exemplifies uh, one approach to this would be to provide um, generous clips and copes uh, at the bottom of your stiffeners, in particular in the haunched area, um, to allow uh, water and debris um, to uh, not collect. So that was for haunch girders, but of course, even for um, constant depth girders, you have often stiffeners, transverse stiffeners that are welded on, uh, and these require clips at the bottom uh, to prevent this debris from, from building up and to allow drainage along the flange length. Uh, many states use a, a two inch clip as their standard. That's sort of a minimal clip size, uh, in our opinion. Three inches is better. Um, if you get even larger than that, that's great. Uh, you know, one common practice is the uh, the pop or the soda can chest. If a soda can can pass through it, then it's big enough. Um, and that's a, a good rule of thumb for any portion of a, a drainage system design. Uh, next slide. Uh, one other approach here is a tactical painting of a weathering steel bridge. So um, painting specific areas where uh, we know are problematic uh, ahead of time uh, is a good way to prevent any sort of future problems with weathering steel. So if you do have joints on your bridge, if you haven't been able to get rid of all of them due to the span lengths or, or other reasons, um, then one approach would be to paint the girder uh, just for a short distance either side of the joint. Uh, often states will use a, a one and a half times the depth of the girder as a good rule of thumb for how much uh, to paint. Uh, that has proven to be very successful. Uh, other uh, areas what might be locally painted are uh, over interior piers, and that's primarily from an aesthetic approach to prevent staining of the of the pier underneath. There are other approaches that, uh, that we'll talk about a little later. Um, and then a third uh, region that uh, you should consider painting on an uncoated weathering steel bridge is any area of the girder that might be encased in concrete. Uh, so what's being shown here is an integral abutment bridge, um, and you can see that the area of the steel girder that will eventually be encased uh, when the rest of the back wall is poured has been painted. Uh, and that's because uh, concrete is a uh, uh, has a very large thermal mass, and so uh, the process uh, goes something like this. At night, uh, everything tends to cool down, including the concrete, uh, and then when the day starts uh, and everything starts to warm up, including the air and the humidity of the air, uh, increases. Uh, the concrete still remains relatively cool, steel being a very excellent uh, thermal conductor um, in the area of the concrete will also remain cool. Uh, so you have warm, humid air against cold steel, and that's what leads to condensation of moisture onto the steel, uh, which then sort of wicks uh, into the area between the steel and the concrete through capillary action. And it doesn't take much moisture over many days before you start to have a problem here with localized corrosion. Um, so that's the reason why you need to paint uh, your weathering steel where it's embedded in concrete. Uh, note that this doesn't apply to top flanges that get embedded in decks. Uh, that the issue has never been seen in that region, or at least not to the extent that it's been seen in, in other areas. Next slide. So we've talked a little bit about um, water and keeping debris from trapping. Uh, most bridges do have a longitudinal slope to them, and you get water flowing down uh, the tops and sometimes the bottoms of flanges. Um, and that can collect if allowed to uh, sort of deposit itself at bearings uh, in other areas. And so one approach to controlling that is to use drip bars uh, to control the drainage on the on the flanges, particularly the bottom flanges. Um, there's um, some debate over, over the efficacy of this, um, but I don't think um, they they certainly don't cause any harm. Um, and it there is an anecdotal information that, that this does work. 
Um, so as what's shown on the left here, you have um, drip bars on the top of the top of the bottom flange angled at 30 to 45 degrees. And therefore any slope, any flow coming down the slope of the flange would be diverted off the edges of the, of the flange. And then underneath you can just uh, put a, a drip bar straight across and that prevents any uh, water flow that's attached itself to the bottom of the bottom flange uh, from continuing past that point. Uh, these are usually welded, especially in areas of compression. Um, if you do have uh, these located on a tension flange, then you're going to want to check the fatigue implications of, of those sorts of welds. And if it's unacceptable, you, you can bond them with epoxy rather than welding. Moving into some of the further drainage details, uh, one of the common problems that's been seen in the past are when um, downspouts from deck scuppers uh, have not been extended far enough below the, the bottom of steel. Uh, and uh, oftentimes a, a rain event will be accompanied by relatively strong winds that can blow the drainage that's uh, coming out of the bottom of the downspout back onto the steel uh, and cause an area of, of uh, continued moisture. And so extending that downspout uh, a, a sufficient distance below the bottom of steel is important to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, often a 12 inch distance is used in this uh, area. Uh, box girders are, are something of a challenge to ensure that they perform adequately. Uh, the interior of, of such closed shapes, either box girders, box columns, uh, anything like that, uh, can collect water. Uh, and it can remain uh, wet for long periods of time because there's very little airflow through there uh, to uh, evaporate the water. Uh, in the past, there have been um, many designs that have uh, tried to uh, completely prevent water from entering the, uh, the girder. And that often has not worked well. So sealing the sealing the closed shapes completely against water ingress uh, typically is not successful. And so you need to really think about, should water get in, how do I let it get out so that it doesn't collect? That's not to say that you shouldn't try and prevent water from coming in. Uh, certainly trying to seal uh, holes and being mindful of the gaps at uh, field splices and things like that uh, is still very good. And to try and limit the amount of water coming in, uh, but you shouldn't rely on that as the only method. Of preventing that. So you need to think about how to get the water out if it gets in. So looking at slopes, again, putting drainage holes um, at the low points. So that's what's shown on the left here. If you have bottom stiffeners, you might need drainage holes for each stiffener. Uh, and then one at the, at the very low point of the cross section. Um, obviously, you don't want uh, birds and small mammals from getting in your, your box girder, so you want to screen those. Uh, and think about using caulk and other drainage uh, directivity devices there to keep the flow uh, going to the drain holes and not collecting. Uh, if you don't do this, water can sit for long periods of time and, and um, it uh, is not uncommon to see closed shapes that haven't been um, detailed appropriately, have, having significant corrosion where water has, has ponded. Uh, next slide. Um, another concern uh, in, in design is with the similar metals. Um, I like this picture. Um, it's, it's not uh, a design issue so much as it, it is a construction error, uh, but it dramatically shows the difference uh, when you have uh, metals that really aren't compatible. Um, so what's shown are, are three uh, nuts on high strength bolts. Uh, the middle, the, the two at the ends were uncoated weathering steel uh, appropriate nuts. Uh, the middle nut was a regular steel nut used uh, incorrectly. And you can see that's almost entirely corroded away at this point. Um, so you gotta make sure that you have compatible materials. Um, you, you, it's easy to kind of go overboard here. There are situations where um, using metals of different corrosion potentials is, is fine. Uh, you need to think a little bit about area ratios. So if the area of the um, more corrodible metal is small compared to the uh, area of the less corrodible metal, then that's sort of where you're going to get into trouble. If it's the other way around, then that usually is not a problem at all. And we'll talk a little bit more in the next slide on that. And that happens to be with um, galvanized components attached to uncoated weathering steel uh, bridges. Uh, the weathering action of the weathering steel does drive some corrosion in the attached component. Um, so during the formation of the patina, um, that will sort of uh, tend to accelerate the deterioration of the um, zinc coating on the galvanized component, but that tends to stop when the patina fully forms. Um, so if you have uh, areas that uh, are not going to be frequently wet um, and you expect uh, good and quick uh, patina formation, then attaching um, galvanized components directly to the webbing steel, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, but you, if you have more exposed areas um, where it might take longer for the patina to form, 
um, then you're going to lose a lot of your um, zinc coating and you can you should consider electrical isolation between the components um, with an isolation pad or similar next slide so moving from uh, directly from design considerations into more uh, fabrication and construction considerations um, we can the, the manual addresses these as well uh, a lot of the fabrication considerations are uh, more aesthetic uh, than performance um, weathering steel uh, if it's appropriately fabricated and constructed can really have a, a quite a pleasing aesthetic appearance and so a lot of these uh, recommendations that are in the manual are uh, focused on trying to encourage um, that type of, of um, appearance the formation of the patina takes uh, a significant amount of time it's not a quick process and so you want to um, help that along as much as you can and ensure that it'll be uniform um, a lot of the steel, when it comes uh, from the mill, will have mill scale on it, um, and it, it will perform well if you leave the mill scale on, um, but it does tend to cause the uh, weathering steel to have a very mottled appearance during the early stages of the patina, and it really takes a long time before it, it becomes more uniform. So the recommendation is to shot blast uh, the girders and remove the mill scale so that you get a more uniform patina formation and, and much improved aesthetics. Um, any markings that are often used? And steel fabrication that are left uh, on the steel and not removed um, can stain the surface. That's what's being shown in the bottom picture there. Um, and so that's a consideration as well. Um, the other uh, thing to think about in, in fabrication is material handling. So how the girders are supported uh, in the shop and uh, in the yard, if they have to remain in the yard for a long period of time, leaving them on wooden blocking for long periods of time um, can cause localized areas of discoloration. Um, one of the best practices or, or, or best recommended practices is uh, if you're, if you're going to have your um, girders uh, in the yard for a while is to occasionally go out and hose them down and put them through some wet and dry cycles there to, to start the patina formation process early. Uh, next slide. In terms of construction, the primary consideration here is, is uh, trying to prevent staining uh, from the girders, uh, from staining the, um, the concrete piers. Um, there's a couple different ways to do that. Um, early on when the patina is just, just starting, you can get a lot of uh, rusty water coming off the girders. Uh, one approach that's shown in the photos here on the right is to wrap the substructure during construction uh, with visqueen or other impermeable wraps uh, to prevent the staining from occurring. Uh, the bottom photo shows the sort of a pier that was treated this way during construction and also has a coating system on it. Uh, and this was many years after construction. And it it uh, shows quite well that you can control the, the staining there. Uh, other approaches are drip pans. These are sort of stainless steel sheet metal pans that are constructed around the bearings to collect uh, the runoff from the girders and, and direct it away from the concrete surfaces. Uh, concrete coatings are helpful with this as well. And I mentioned before, you can, you can zone paint the steel girders in the area of the pier to try and prevent um, that from happening. Uh, and don't neglect your storage requirements. Uh, during construction either. Um, there have been instances where uh, girders were stored inappropriately on site and that caused some difficulty in getting a good patina to form. And in that case, I'm, uh, they were allowed to be, become submerged in floodwaters, uh, which is not a good idea. The next slide. So moving uh, out of construction and then once the bridge is, is constructed, uh, the manual provides guidance on appropriate ways to inspect weathering steel bridges, um, guidance on what the appropriate surfaces should look like. So there's some photos there showing good performing uh, surfaces. And further down below, there's some uh, poor performing surfaces, you know, what to look for uh, as an indication that your patina is not adequately forming. Um, there's something called a tape test that's detailed in there where you take some packaging tape and apply it to the surface and pull it off. And then the amount uh, of, uh, and the shape and size of the, any steel particles that come off, rust particles that come off will tell you whether the patina is performing uh, correctly or not. Uh, next slide. Moving then uh, from inspection onto maintenance, uh, well, the manual provides some best practices for uh, owners in how to maintain their weathering steel bridges to get the best performance out of them. Um, issues such as joint sealing should, should come as no surprise as being a, a prime a recommendation there uh, to keep your joints from leaking uh, water onto your girders. Uh, understanding that your drainage system doesn't function if it's not kept clean um, and that they need to be flushed out occasionally. And then girder washing, it, there's good data that that uh, does uh, indicate strongly uh, with a good performing weathering steel. Uh, next slide. So there's a, a bit of a table here that's included as well, um, showing uh, what maintenance best practices can be used uh, and are recommended. 
And so just cleaning off debris with the, with a broom or compressed air is recommended one to two years, and then um, washing and flushing your girders uh, two to four years are sort of the general recommendations. Uh, next slide. Uh, the drainage system, we, we, we tend to ignore it a little bit in design, and it gets ignored as well a lot of times in maintenance, um, but often a neglected component of a bridge, uh, but really can have uh, strong impacts on the life of the bridge. So here's a good picture of a, a drainage system that's no longer functioning. I believe this is inside a box girder, uh, not something you want to occur. Um, so maintenance systems on uh, the drainage systems on bridges require regular maintenance and repair to keep them functioning and, and shouldn't be neglected. In, in terms of repair and rehabilitation, the manual has some recommendations as well. So if you are having some trouble with a weathering steel bridge, uh, for whatever reason, um, they are relatively easy to address. Um, you can uh, tactically paint in the field after the bridge is in place. Um, if you have a joint that's leaking, uh, you can paint the ends of the weathering steel uh, bridge. Uh, on the left is a, a joint and a truss that wasn't uh, performing quite as well, so that localized area was painted uh, to prevent localized corrosion. Uh, next slide. And you can do this for the whole bridge as well. Um, if uh, for whatever reason, it's not living up to your expectations. Um, this has been done uh, in the past with, with no uh, apparent difficulties. Uh, this first coat of paint is gonna take a lot more paint than, uh, than it would if it was just a blast surface uh, because of the uneven properties of that. Uh, but bridges that have been uh, exposed to the weather for, for many years have been successfully painted um, and the other thing to think about is even if you have to do this at some point, you're, you're still probably ahead of the game in terms of even initial and even life cycle costs because you've gotten a 20 or 30 years of, of good performance out of your uncoated weathering steel without the need to paint up front. Even if you have to paint later on um, in an overall viewpoint, you're still uh, doing quite well. So with that, I think that was the end of uh, the prepared presentation.